So Oberlin was, uh, has been a hotbed of free thought since it was founded in 1833. Uh, in fact, it, it was founded by these two guys, uh, a, a minister, John Shippard and Philo Stewart, who was a missionary, and they were in Elyria, also up there in Orion County, not far from, from where Oberlin was founded. They decided that Elyria, which was the town, uh, the, the county seat, was full of sin, too many bars, and probably too much politics. And so they decided that as Christian men, they wanted to find, found a community uh, and a college together in the wilderness of the Western Reserve where they could teach, teach you know, uh, God's love as part of the Second Great Awakening, but also have clean living and uh, no alcohol and no coffee or tea. And so what they were looking for, they were founding the, the town 10 miles from sin. Sin being Elyria, where the politics was, and Amherst, Ohio, where I grew up, where the Germans were making beer, right? So they, were, they, they, they wandered around the wilderness of the Western Reserve for a while and couldn't find a, a spot. And so they, they knelt down and prayed next to this big, uh, big uh, elm tree. And while they were praying, some guy like runs up and he goes, did you see that? And they said, no, we were praying. And he said, well, Bear just jumped out of that tree and amazingly didn't kill you, you know? <laughs> and so they decided that's where Oberlin should be because the bear was a sign from God, right? Because they, they survived the bear. And so um, they founded Oberlin and the college at the same time, uh, 10 miles from Amherst and 10 miles from Elyria and 14 miles from Wellington, all these little towns. And But they needed students and they needed money and they needed, uh, uh, which we call they needed professors, right? They didn't have any of that, they just had a location. And so what they did at the same time uh, in Ohio, uh, there was this, uh, there was uh, Ryman Beecher, uh, who was Harriet Beecher Stowe's father. He was the head of the Lane Cemetery, which was down on the Kentucky border in Cincinnati. And I didn't realize until I started investigating it, that there was like a rift in the abolitionists. Uh, and Lyman Beecher was actually a conservative abolitionist, and he thought that the slaves should be freed and sent back to Africa, right? But the people up in Oberlin thought that the, the slaves should be freed and become citizens with full rights and even, even a, a leg up, like some sort of a welfare system to help them get established. So that's how far apart northern and southern Ohio were and still are. There's, you know, it's very different. And so what they, what they uh, down in the Lane Seminary, uh, they were having these great debates that were actually publicized in New York City. Uh, other abolitionists knew about this. And there were these uh, students, there were 40 students and a few faculty uh, who became the Lane Rebels because they were kicked out by Wyman Beecher's people. They were kicked out of the Lane Seminary. And so they, they wanted to a place where they could uh, preach this pure abolitionism of giving the free, the slaves free, you know, whole citizenship. So they came up to Oberlin and they became the original students. The Lane Rebels, they were called, became the original students. And what they did was, um, they got to work right away, right? So Oberlin was founded in 1833. The Oberlin Anti-Slavery Society was started in 1835. And there was a, a line on one of my family members was part of the original society. And in 1837, the first fugitive slaves, slaves were reported as traveling through Oberlin to Canada. So you had immediately, right off the bat, as soon as it was founded, they got into trouble with uh, President Buchanan, who was a, uh, uh, a pro-slavery Democrat. This is when the Democrats were conservative and the Republicans were the party of Lincoln. So things are kind of flipped around today. <laughs> but, so anyway, um, one of the big leaders of the abolition movement in Oberlin was uh, Charles Braxton Finney. He was an abolitionist in New York. He heard about what they were doing in the wilds of Northern Ohio and came. He was a professor there, but then eventually the second president. So you have him, he was a fiery uh, preacher. He taught that you could be saved as many times as you repented. And so it was the idea that you weren't gonna go to hell, that you could still be saved. And so what he did, uh, along with the first president of, of Oberlin, was really uh, solidify this idea that, um, that they were going to help the fugitive slaves. And what, um, what you have going on then is you have sort of a perfect storm, okay? You have these free saint thinkers, you have the Christian moralism of the, the idea that slavery was against the will of God and that it should be gone. Ohio was a free state right next to Kentucky, which was a slave state. 
Uh, you also had this community built on temperance and prayer and righteousness and hard work and, you know, it was the whole Puritan thing going on, basically. And so uh, what you have going around in Ohio is like this, you can see the reward poster for fugitive slaves, but then you also have these warnings, you know, these leaflets being passed around in Oberlin and other free, free towns, warning the slaves that we think somebody's here, so be careful, stay hidden, you know, that sort of thing. And so in 1850, the U.S. government uh, signed the, the second Fugitive Slave Act, and that's what gave the Kentuckians the right to come up into Ohio and get the slaves and take them back to slavery, okay? But what you also have is those uppity Ohioans saying, no, our Ohio Constitution says that we are a free state and we do not recognize the U.S. Constitution. What does that sound like? Prop 122 that Arizona passed last week. It's the same thing. <laughs> so what the Ohioans were saying was that we believe that that law is unconstitutional and we are not going to follow it, right? And so, but Buchanan is thinking, dang, we're going to get let them get away with this, right? And so, uh, they, Ohio and Oberlin in particular was already on Buchanan's radar. So what you have, things really came to a head on uh, September 13, 1858, when U.S. Marshals came up into Oberlin with some Kentucky slaveholders and they tricked the, um, the uh, fugitive slave, John Price, who was the one being referred to in the, uh, in the uh, lawyer's uh, statement that uh, Brian uh, read. John Price had been living as a free man in Air Oberlin for two years, doing handiwork, actually getting, they had like a local, local welfare system, and so they actually gave him like a, a, a little bit of money to get himself established, and people hired him, and there were plenty of, of uh, former fugitive slaves living in, in Oberlin uh, as free men and, and going to Oberlin College because it was set up from the beginning in 1833 to allow blacks and women, and no other college in the U.S. was doing that. They were the first ones to do both. So you had uh, blacks and whites uh, mingling, you had black lawyers, you had black professors, you had black and white students, and so it was very, uh, it was very uh, diverse, uh, but, but also they were held together by that Christian moralism and the belief that slavery was wrong, okay? So on that day when they captured uh, John Price, they're taking him back down to Wellington, Ohio, which is, uh, you can see uh, the little blue dots, you can see Oberlin and Wellington 14 miles south. So they were going along Route 58, which at the time was dirt. And uh, they have John Price tied up in the back of their buckboard, and they're, they're traveling down to Wellington to catch the train to go take him back to Columbus and then back to Kentucky. And going north on Route 58 is Ansel Lyman, my great great uncle, with one of his pals. They were college students at Oberlin. And they're going north, and they hear John Price screaming from the buckboard, right? But they didn't, they didn't challenge the marshals because they had guns, and these college students did. They go back, and on the way back, Ansel's buddy says, Let's not get involved, you know. Let's let's not do anything. We'll just, you know, it's just some black guy. Let's let him take him back. Let's not get involved. So they get back to Oberlin, and Ansel Lyman blew off his buddy and told everybody in Oberlin what had happened to John Price, right? And so the next day, according to accounts, they took every horse and buggy and buckboard out of the stables in Oberlin, and hundreds of townspeople, plus a few rifles, maybe of some clubs, hundreds of townspeople from Oberlin wrote down uh, Route 58 to Wellington to save John Price. So here you have one little town in Oberlin attacking another little, uh, one little town in Ohio attacking another little town in Ohio. And so they go to, um, they go to Oberlin and John Price is being held in the Wadsworth Hotel, which is uh, on the right of the screen up there. And so they, they first they try to negotiate, and they try some legal maneuvering. They try the whole idea that, you know, this law is unconstitutional. They're not getting anywhere. So a few of them sneak into the hotel. They come find John Price up in the attic, and they literally throw him out the window, land him in a, in a buckboard, and take him back to Oberlin. So they steal him back, right? <laughs> so so they, they take him to the house that's shown up here. This was a, uh, a Fairchild house. It was owned by a professor who was sympathetic to the anti-slavery movement, but his house had not been a safe house, and they figured that the Kentuckians wouldn't find him there. So they steal him out of the Washburn Health Hell, they take him to the Fairchild House, and um, eventually John Price goes to Canada, never to be heard from again. But who is heard from are the Oberlin rescuers, 
President Buchanan didn't want to let the city of the town of Overland get away with this, and so what they did was they uh, they they uh, grand jury indicted 37 Overlandites, uh, and this is. Uh, a group of them there, and Ansel Lyman is one of those tall guys with the beard in the back row. They indicted 37 Overlandites for a violation of the Fugitive Slave Act because they stopped the Kentuckians from taking John Price back to Kentucky, right? They put them all in jail in Cleveland. This is, they're standing in front of the jail in, in this photo. Uh, but in defiance, you know, Ohio says, well, she could play that game, right? Uh, because they didn't recognize the Fugitive Slave Act. So they arrested the marshal and the Kentuckians and put them in jail and said, we don't believe that the Fugitive Slave Act is constitutional, even though the Supreme Court had already said it was. This is all this time for today, right? <laughs> so they said, no, 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 this is not constitutional, and, we're, and these guys are in violation because they can't kidnap a free citizen, John Price, in Oberlin. And so then they would have a stalemate. So they had the marshal in jail, and then they had the Oberlin, Oberlin rescuers in, in jail. So. Uh, what happened was they, they eventually had a plea deal and they let the marshals out of jail, but they still kept the rescuers. But what they decided to do, they dismissed a few of them, and then this group in this photo is like the last 20 some, and then only two of the guys were actually uh, were actually tried, a black man and a white man, Simeon Bushnell and uh, Charles Langston, a black guy, were tried, but these other guys stayed in jail with them in solidarity. And what they were saying, again, was they were saying that the Fugitive Slave Act was unconstitutional, but the other thing that the over the rescuers were saying was that it was against their religion to follow that law. Does that sound familiar? That's SB 1062. It's against my religion uh, to, to, be, uh, to allow slavery to happen, so I'm going to defy that law because it's against my religion. That's what they were saying. And so uh, what happened, though, is that, oops, what happened, though, is that the rescuers turned out to be really good PR guys, you know. So while they were there, a lot of them, like Charles, uh, Charles Branson Finney, was already known. He was the president of Oberlin College at the time. He wasn't in jail, but he was out there giving these fiery speeches. The trial had all kinds of fiery speeches by Charles Langston and uh, John Mercer Langston, his brother, and by Riddle, the, the speech that, um, that uh, Brian Moon uh, read. And they also had uh, a, a newspaper. They put out a newspaper while they were in jail. They, they really fanned the flames of abolition. I mean, really, Buchanan should have just left them alone, because what they did was they made it a cause celebre worldwide with these guys standing up against the US government saying that that law is not constitutional, and we don't have to do this because we believe that slavery is wrong in the eyes of God. And so eventually, <laughs> what they did was um, they, they didn't have big sentences in the end. I think that the, the government realized what a mess they made of, of things by, by giving them a voice, you know, putting them in jail and then making them martyrs, essentially. And so um, the one guy, uh, Bushnell, got like 60 days, and I think Langston got 20 days in jail. But they had been held since December, and they finally got out in July. And so uh, you can see this is like one of the handbills. They had a big party in Overland the night that they got home and things like that. And so uh, what's interesting was that their, their situation, what they did, you know, to stand up for that one man really led, they say, led to the Civil War and that it, it really shed light on what was going on. But I think what is really interesting is when you look at this story of, of the Overland rescuers and the, the abolitionists, there are so many parallels to what's going on today. Besides the SB 1062, the it's against my religion, and the uh, Prop 122, that law is unconstitutional, so I'm not going to uh, not going to abide by it. You know, you have the idea of equality for minorities and women. You have the idea of wage slavery and exploitation of workers. You have the idea of, of helping versus exploiting people who are are fleeing from injustice. I mean, look at the uh, look at the Central American children. You know, fleeing Central America because they're being murdered and and, and raped and persecuted down there. They come up here. They cross cross the Rio Grande River. And what are we going to do? Are we going to send them back or are we going to help them? There's that. There's so many parallels between the anti-slavery movement and the immigration movement right here in Arizona. There's also the idea of freedom of speech and academic freedom. The lane uh, the lane rebels. 
they thought they had academic freedom, and and uh, Lyman Beecher says, no, you don't. You, you don't agree with me. You're out of here. You know. And we have people trying to shut down academic freedom right here at the University of Arizona. There's the idea of welfare. They thought that the the, the uh, people who were poor should should be given a social safety net, and others thought, you know, and send them back and out of here. You know. So anyway, I want to end uh, the little talk here with uh, just a thought about Ansel Lyman. And what would have happened if Ansel Lyman had followed his friend's advice and stayed out of it? What if he had kept quiet instead of going back to Oberlin and getting all those people up in their up in arms to go back and, and save John Price and really push the idea of slavery? So anyway, I want you to all to think about Ansel Lyman the next time you're, you're faced with making a decision of keeping quiet or speaking out for social justice.